working with some very, very senior leaders around the globe. And I'm going to share with you a little secret. That secret is, without fail, every single one of them experiences doubt, anxiety, concern, and wait for it, fear. Fear, just like you and I, fear of success, fear of failure, fear of being found out, fear of not being good enough, fear that the decision that they're about to make may actually have such a profound impact that it may come back and bite them. And the interesting thing is, is that when we unpack that fear, when we unpack the fear, the doubt, the anxiety, or the concern, the interesting thing is what we find is this. But there is what my colleagues and I refer to as the gap. And what do I mean by the gap? We're talking about stimulus and response. So before they take action, what you find is some of them want to stay in the gap. Do I move forward? What do I do? What should I do? Should I think about this? What's this? What's going on? Da, 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 da. So they are procrastinating. Others want to step back and retreat to the place that they know well and they feel safe and they feel comfortable. There are, of course, those that very much do the feel the fear and let me take action and let me just get on with it. But what I want to do in this talk is share with you a small secret, a small change that can have a profound, and I mean truly profound, impact. And that small change is this. Nature has solved virtually all of the problems that we can possibly think we have to solve ourselves. So if we tap into the natural genius that is in nature, we can get some fresh thinking, some fresh perspectives. So don't just take my word for it. Let me give you a couple of examples. Japanese engineers working on one of the fastest trains in the world, the Shinkansen bullet train. That train travels at something like 200 miles an hour. Now here's the thing. The nature of the track is that the train has to travel through a lot of urban areas. And it has to travel through a lot of tunnels. And one of the problems that they found they had is that they, you know, obviously mastered the speed, that wasn't a problem. What they had a problem with is that when the train came out of a tunnel, sonic boom. It would reverberate throughout the communities. And naturally, you're going to get complaints and concerns. So every time the train went through a tunnel, went through uh, an urban area, not good. So how are they going to solve the problem Speed and sound. So rather stumped, they needed to do a little bit more creative and innovative thinking. So one of those engineers was particularly interested in birds. So he raised his hand and said, well, look, I'm going to take a look at nature. I'm going to ask nature. I'm going to consult with the natural genius that is nature. And he started to look at different birds and little different bird patterns. And here's the thing. Where in nature have they mastered speed and sound. What he found was the kingfisher bird. You see, the thing about the kingfisher is this. The kingfisher has to sweep from great height through air, change the medium through water, grab its prey without making a sound. No splash, no ripples, because of course, it comes through the water, makes a lot of noise, you know what's going to happen, the fish are going to swim on it. So, of course, you know, kingfisher are going to get hungry. So it's learned the art of travelling through two mediums, air at speed, water at speed, without making a splash. And the way that it's done it is through its beak. So what the uh, Japanese engineers did was they decided to prototype. Let's create a series of bullet trains, or bullet train engines in fairness, Let's create a series of bullet train engines with different beak-like structures. And let's see which one works the best. And lo and behold, 
It was the kingfisher. So they managed to solve their problems in relation to speed and sound. But here was the other thing. The thing that they hadn't anticipated. This was the bonus for them. Is that the bullet train, now, speed and sound sorted, was far more efficient. You see, because what happened is, it doesn't push the air, which is one of the problems that was causing the sonic boom. What it does is it cuts through the air. So the air comes over the engine, makes it far more efficient. So it's using less electricity, it's getting people to where they need to be much, much faster, and guess what? They don't have the problem with the sonic boom. All from consulting with nature. Let me give you another example. We're all familiar with migratory birds. You know, every year, thousands and thousands of birds, you know, move from one continent to another. And the interesting thing about that is that it's incredibly stressful for those birds, incredibly stressful. It's a long way that they are flying. So they get what's called oxidative stress, they get disease, they get metabolic inflammation, fatigue. Those that are a little bit more fragile, they don't make the journey. So, what researchers and nutritionists and sports scientists have started to recognise and observe in migratory birds is their pattern of changing their diet before they start. So yes, naturally they've got a little bit more weight. Yes, they practice a little bit more than flying, so they change their diet, they change their nutrition to build up muscle. But what they also do is something that which I think is really interesting. They change their diet. So they move from eating bugs to eating berries. But not just any berries, particularly bright coloured berries. Why bright coloured berries? Because of all of the lifestyle medicine people sitting here in the room, which I know there are a couple, what they know is those berries are full of antioxidants. And antioxidants are a little bit like a superfood. They are absolutely powerful at absorbing the free radicals that arise out of oxidative stress. So as I've said, what we're seeing now with those individuals, sports scientists and nutritionists, they are starting to help the elite athletes in terms of preparing for long periods of stress, long periods of training, endurance, by changing their diet in accordance with the patterns of migratory birds. So how does all of this help us in terms of us becoming fearless? Now notice I say fearless, not reckless. There's a danger sometimes when we talk about, let's all be fearless, that somehow we're going to be reckless. I'm not talking about being reckless. I'm talking about fearing less. Okay? Fearing a little bit less. Because fear is not bad, not bad for us. So I want to introduce you to an absolutely awesome plant, the Cochiana attenuata, also known as the wild tobacco plant. You see, because I think we can all learn some tips and some strategies from the Cochiana attenuata in terms of how we can all become fearless and unstoppable. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She has an ability to adapt. All right, I admit I am biased. She has an ability to adapt like no other plant. <coughs> Under pressure and stress, she pauses, she gathers some information, and then she does something that I think is really interesting. She starts a prototype. So let me give you an example. Like all plants, she, from time to time, undergoes you know, the attack. Insects kind of come, they kind of land, they want to hang out. And of course, you know, she's got a mission. She's very clear, she's set her intent. She needs to grow, she needs to mature, and she needs to pollinate. She knows what she's about, right? So, magic, infestation, luscious, green. She's beautiful, isn't she? She's beautiful. You know, wouldn't you, if you were an insect, you want to hang out there, wouldn't you? If you would. All right, so this is the third. Because she's got her clear intent, grow, mature, pollinate, this is what she does. If the infestation gets a little bit too much, she releases a toxin. 
poisons them, kills them off. The interesting thing is that toxin is what? It's nicotine. Nicotine. So the smoke is in the room? Take note. All right. So she's killed off the infestation, she's growing, she's maturing, and she's heading to pollination. Now here's the thing, she recognises this. There's a lot of competition during the day when it comes to pollination. You know, there's other plants all flowering and blooming at the same time. So she recognises, you know what, I can't do this on my own. You know, it's not, you know, she's a plant. At the end of the day, she can't take the seeds and just scatter them around. Yeah, she's overly reliant on a breeze to come along. So no, she adapts. And what she does is she creates a joint venture, a collaboration with the hawk moth. The thing about the hawk moth is the hawk moth is nocturnal. So guess what she does? She blossoms at night. Attracts the hawk moth. The hawk moth comes in, does its thing, pollinates our wonderful wild tobacco plant. The thing is with every joint venture, with every, every collaboration, there is a price to pay. Yeah? And the price that Nicotiana attenuata has to pay is this. The hawk moth lays loads of eggs, and those eggs obviously grow into caterpillars. And those of you who are familiar with the tale of the hungry caterpillar will know. <laughs> caterpillars munch leaves. But the interesting thing is, because you imagine it's got, a, um, you know, the Cochiano attenuata has got a relationship with the hawk moth, and obviously it's got a relationship with those eggs, and it's got a relationship with the caterpillar, and that is this. If she just deploys the old strategy of releasing the nicotine, trying to poison the caterpillar and poison the eggs, it doesn't work, because this caterpillar is immune to nicotine. So, as I've said, she's persevering, she's adaptive, so what does she do? She's under attack. Now, here's the thing. One caterpillar, very, very hungry, over a period of two days, can destroy and eat its way through a whole Nicotiana attenuata plant. So she, she can't stand in the gap. Stimulus response, stimulus response. She can't procrastinate. She's actually got to take some action. Because this is now about survival. She's under significant stress. She's fearing for her life right now. So what does she do? She gathers some information. And she then secretes an amazing nectar. And this nectar makes the caterpillars go wild. The interesting thing is they roll in it. They eat a little bit more. That's fantastic. But what they're not aware of, first of all, is this. It slows down their appetite and slows down their digestion. So she buys herself a little bit more time. The second thing is this. She puts out a call. She recognises success is not a solo journey. There are so she needs some help here. She understands the principle of joint ventures and collaborations. So she's going to ask for some help. So that help, she does is she sends out a scent. She sends out a scent to attract the insects that really enjoy eating the caterpillar. Now, this caterpillar is now covered in this beautiful nectar, and guess who really loves this nectar? Yeah, those mercenary insects. So you can see that Nicotiana attenuata is adapting all of the time, taking a look around what's going on, and then gathering that information and doing something with it. She doesn't hang out just in the gap. Yeah? So she's stepping forward, she's not stepping back. That's the, one of the key things. But do you know something? What she does recognise is this. Sometimes that doesn't work either. And if that doesn't work, she's got to adapt again. So this time, she says, goodbye, hawk moth. I'm now going to blossom during the day. I know there's more competition, but I'm going to blossom during the day. And this time, she chooses to attract Hummingbirds. And of course, she's achieving her ultimate goal of priority, and that is one of pollination. So, what are the tips that we can take away from all of this in terms of helping us fear less, not become reckless, remember? Helping us fear less and become unstoppable. Or just 
observing and exploring the Koshiana and the Tinwata for me has meant that what I do is when I recognise that I have moments of doubt, anxiety or fear, that it is just simply a flag to me to say this is a moment of choice. It's a moment of choice. And what it does then, and the tips that I take away are this, I need to change my thinking. I need to change my thinking from I can't to I can. Just means I'm going to pause, readjust my thinking, and then start to think of some strategies. So success, as I've said, is not a solo journey. So one of the things is, all right, what have I done in the past that might help me in this situation. We saw with Nikoshiana and Tinawata, she knows all about the power of the nicotine. So I look back in my experiences and go, where have I done something like this before? Can I give that a try? But if that doesn't work, I don't stay there in the gap procrastinating and I do not retreat. I do not step back. What I then do is this. I look for collaborations and I look for joint ventures, but I am always alert and I am aware to the fact that, guess what, there may be a payoff. So I make sure I inquire about that too. So, I get clear about my intent, I change my thinking. See, it's not rocket science. So I encourage you to do something really, really simple. When you recognize you've got moments of doubt and anxiety, when you are feeling the fear, pause a little, think about how can you become fearless? How can you become unstoppable? And you just take a look at nature, look outside your window, look outside the door, look at the dandelions, look at what you think are weeds, and look at how they are solving daily problems, and look at the tips and strategies and see if they can help you. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you.